Hi. As we've seen in my previous video, the School of the Seven Arts at Chartres Cathedral regarded music as number in time. Geometry being number in space, and astrology being number in time and space. We'll soon see that music and astronomy have many similarities. They are in a way akin to each other. Geometry to me doesn't feel as close to music. I've played around with geometric shapes in comparison to music for many many hours, but it never really paid off. I guess it's because the two belong in different dimensions. If you study the sources that cover the curriculum at Chartres during the Middle Ages, the subject music is scarcely mentioned, except for a few obvious references to Pythagoras' musical ratios. Now it might surprise you that I am not interested in those in the least. As I have mentioned once before, it is my intent to further the remains of this forgotten science. And besides that, I feel that most of what was covered in these gatherings has been lost in time for reasons we can only speculate. So from here on out, I am switching over to my own research, which is very similar to what one might imagine was discussed in the Middle Ages. This channel will not be another one of these speculating sources that just point at facts and express surprise. I'm planning to just give answers. Maybe wrong answers, but answers nonetheless. Things that I have found in my 15 years of research trying to find out what music is. And it has been quite a hero's journey, taking me to every corner of the known scientific, historic and mythological world. And now it is time for the return. Time to share my findings. We followed our hero then from the innocent world of childhood to an initial call of adventure, which creates a separation at the crossing of the first threshold. Usually followed then by some initial trial whereby the hero can no longer return home. Then he begins the phase of initiation through various trials, whether they be dragon battles or brother battles or abductions, until at the low point of the story, the hero experiences some kind of symbolic death or dismemberment. Uh, after that death occurs, there is a various means of atonement uh, that the hero can face, either through the goddess, through a marriage, through uh, a atonement or recognition by the father, through some kind of power, through apotheosis or becoming divinity, or through the achieving of some goal. And sometimes, of course, a mix of all four of these things. And then a lot of our stories kind of seem to end somewhere in here, or this last little bit anyway, becomes a little truncated. We're most interested in the hero's achievement of the goal. But Campbell suggested that the true hero is going to experience a final return back into the top part of this sphere. This sphere. The true hero who returns finally after his adventures will experience the freedom to live. He'll experience the end of the adventure and a successful return home and the opportunity to take that newfound wisdom and share it with others within community. So, to see the simple numerical systems that music incorporates, one has to replace their decimal glasses with duodecimal ones. You see, Music doesn't regard 10 as a whole, but more like a phi ratio. A musical octave consists of 12 unique tones, and should therefore be represented by a counting system that has 12 unique numbers. And this base 12 counting system is generally called the duodecimal system. The word duodecimal seems to imply a combination of two decimal systems. Now, I have not yet decided if this implication is correct. I'm still working on that, but I strongly suspect this to be true. In my early days, playing around with Marco Rodin's Circle of Nine, I did come up with a system for music that incorporates two circles of nine to deal with twelve tones in the octave. This could be translated into a dual decimal system. You know, let's get into this for a few minutes, because it's a lot of fun. This is Marco Rodin's Mathematical Footprint of God. What you see here is a circle divided into nine, with the zero in the middle as being a singularity. This diagram is supposed to teach you about the way energy likes to move in nature, and is thereby saying that nature is numbers, living and breathing numbers. Each of the nine numbers has a specific set of characteristics, and through any number made by the different possible combinations of these numbers, they will always keep expressing their individuality. The diagram is made out of three parts, the 360 degree circle, 
the lazy eight or infinity sign, and three, the compass type shape in red, connecting the three, the six, and the nine. These three numbers don't directly take part in the calculations. Instead, they are the controllers, nine being the source of energy, three being the male component of the energy, and six being the female component of the energy. Now, one of the ways to move around in this diagram is through doubling. We start with 1, double it to 2, to 4, to 8, to 16, etc. But as soon as you hit numbers higher than 9, then numerologically you have to reduce them to one digit. So 16 becomes 7, and 32 becomes 5. And these numbers make the lazy 8 figure. It also works with halving, or powers of 10, or with degrees in a circle. But that's pretty much it. From there on out, everybody's been speculating about what this means and how to use this information, but nothing's really come out of it. But I have made something really cool though, with the help of Marco Rodin, of course, who claims that this system is showing us that our number system is a vortex, which is why they call this method the vortex-based mathematics. And I believe this is the case. However, I think that this only gives half the picture music moves into two directions, so I came up with this. I call it the road map because it shows a musician all the places he can go harmonically. It's a perfect symmetry of the musical tones. It incorporates four ratios. Pi, adjusted slightly. Alternative Pi, a ratio that Karl Monk found at Stonehenge in his research of an ancient matrix system of numbers found in all the megalithic structures around the world. A beautiful documentary. Finally, the square of the megalithic yard shows us this when given to double pi. It's another of their weird constants and one of considerable import. I have come to call it their alternate pi, AP. Give it to the standard generic 360 degree circle and find the actual circumference of Stonehenge in feet. It works just as well off the 360 degree radian to find, once again, the radius of Stonehenge. It's why I call it their alternate pi. It's the constant they employed to explain the relationship of their 12-inch metrological unit to their radian-based matrix. It's really amazing everything that he's found. So to go on, the third ratio is phi, also adjusted slightly, and 1 divided by phi, adjusted slightly. We'll see later why these numbers have to be adjusted, which is a problem that is very similar to the problem of uh, us having to adjust the calendar every year, and the reason why pianos can't be tuned to one perfect tuning system. You can only tune them to one key to make them sound perfect, but usually they're tuned equal tempered, which means um, equally off all over the place. Thankfully, we got used to hearing this. But we're going to find out exactly why I think this is so in a later video, which promises to be quite interesting and surprising. So stick around for that. This here is a picture of the way that the roadmap actually looked when I just made it. The point is that you can jump from one frequency to another in all directions by applying these ratios. It is a system that combines the theory of the circle of nine with astrology using its elements and signs. It lines up the three qualities, fixed, mutable, and cardinal, which in music represent the three uh, diminished chords. And it works great as an actual map for musicians. I had made a beautiful video demonstrating how it works with actually a working version reacting to music playing in the background so you can see what's actually happening in the music. But, through a self-confidence collapse at some point during this journey, I seem to have misplaced it. When I listened to the music while seeing the roadmap in action, I could actually hear the different effects of the different intervals. Pi jumps had a bit of a bang to them, and phi jumps were of course very fluid. It also has something to say about the overtone series. Mostly that most of them seem to fall in just two of the four elements, which is interesting. Because I don't think anyone has, has explained the reason why we have overtone series. I mean, how 
where did it come from? I found some hints in my own research, but I'm really not sure yet. But this thing seems to predict them. The inner and outer rings seem to represent breathing in and out. And if you analyze music by this system, you can feel the, what it's trying to say. Music seems to breathe. Here, look at this. Afternoon in Paris. I want and only love. I've got a whole bunch of them here. I made this to show a friend what I was talking about. These are all jazz standards because these are harmonically most interesting and well thought out. You can see this breathing motion happening everywhere. Doesn't matter what song you look at. The chords that don't fall into the system are either chords with the same bass notes, which makes no difference, or 251 changes, some of those the roadmap regards as breathing in or out in two steps. So this friend took this system from me and started analyzing many other songs and came back to me saying that it actually works. So the roadmap as an analyzing tool seems to be 100% successful and its findings are 100% reproducible. Cool. The problem here was that, yes, it gave me a better idea of the way music deals with energies, but I still had no idea what music looked like or what it is. It was all still a great mystery to me, so I kept searching. About a year later, I entered the duodecimal era of my research. We know the circle of fifths, but we don't know that the circle of fifths is repeated at a greater scale, a fractal layer higher. The wavelengths of this cascade are of interstellar size. The 12 musical notes that we know are in fact the powers of 10 in the base 12 duodecimal counting system. I call these the source frequencies. Each of them is an octave of precisely the frequency that we know from the 432 tuning system. These numbers are not directly associated with the 12 tones, because that's not what they are. What they are though is quite interesting. The 12 tones represent the 12 decimal places of the base 12 counting system. So what we have is 12 different wheels that each carry their own resonance. Of course these powers of Do, as I like to call them, are powers of 12 apart, which is 43 notes to be exact. I tend to believe it's 43.2 notes, but this is hard to verify. Our familiar two-bar musical notation system precisely covers one of these intervals to the note, except for the irritating fact that they shift the central C to C5, which reminds me of the fact that I always have to keep telling my students to use the C4 instead of the C5. Are they right? If this is the case, then we're also wrong about which notes are the high ones and which are the low. And we're also wrong about which hand is left and which hand is right. Because 100% of my young students turns these two things around 100% of the time. Which is a bit exaggerated, but it feels true. The interval is situated between D3, 144 Hz, and A6, 1728 Hz. Note that both numbers are sacred numbers and numerologically add up to 9, like they all do. In duodecimals, they represent the second square and the third cube power of Do. The, the note G0 of 12 Hz would in this case represent a line, and C-3 would be a point, the unity, the monad, 1 Hz. Which brings up a quite interesting idea that the circle of fifths, the order in which musical keys are related to one another, describes a line that goes from six dimensions to one to six negative dimensions. And we can see how all these different dimensions are placed inside the torus. But I'm running ahead. So this system of what I call the source frequencies adheres perfectly to Pythagoras' extended tetractus, tetractus, except for two aspects. It extends in two directions, which represents one of the sets of opposing forces in music, the realm of the sharps and the realm of the flats. And two, it doesn't count numbers but dimensions, or rather sharps and flats. The frequencies that follow from lowering or rising the source frequencies in octaves have many interesting properties. For one, how nicely they mirror across this circle of 84 notes, seven octaves, the piano. And also, 
there is the beautiful overall roundness of the numbers compared to the almost exclusively broken numbers in the decimal system. It is my crazy belief that musical tension can be defined by the relative distance which the notes have to be activated, which should be a word, from their source frequencies, because it works all the time. In a musical scale, only one of the tones is completely in rest. This is what we call the root note. The other notes all have different amounts of tension. That's because their resting points are scattered in neighboring keys around the circle of fifths. You could compare this to elastic bands that are all stretched to different lengths except for the root note, which is completely at rest. Now if we put this tension into a graph and then loop this back on itself, we can start to see the two-dimensional toroidal shape. This here is the key of B-flat which is the actual central key in music and the Schumann resonance, the resonance frequency of the earth. This is going to be so handy later on to just be able to take an explanation from an older video and be done with it. I love it. So back to this Vesica Pisces figure that I've shown many times already. You can regard it as a graph, first of all, with musical tension on the Y axis. The numbers are the source frequencies in powers of Do. So 0 is 1 Hz, 2 is 10 Hz, minus 1 is 0 0.1 Hz. It's strangely reminiscent of the Mendelbrot set, isn't it? This shape moving through a fractal and centering on 1 instead of 0. Stick around. The two rings represent the two whole step scales in music and are yet another of its opposing forces. Furthermore, we see the same 7-5 ratio as we see on the piano between the white and the black keys. Here being the outer notes and the inner notes. The outer notes is where the pop songs are created. The inner notes are the domain of the jazz musicians. The Roman numerals around the vesica are the musical degrees. You're always looking at one key, in this case the musical key of B-flat. If we turn the two rings into each other, like so, we move up and down the vortex, or the harmonic cascade as Dan Winter likes to call it. The 12 dots that are being rotated around always stand for octaves of the same note. I coordinated them by the seven colors of the rainbow, which actually form the musical key of B-flat, which centers on the middle, the singularity of the musical vortex. So the rainbow is the key of B-flat, the Schumann resonances are very close to the key of B-flat, Yes, I said very close this time, and I'm sorry for the confident way I said B-flat in the video. And many ancient monuments resonate to the B-flat. Uh, in, in an intact one, the outer wall had these hollow pockets. And when I went inside one of these with the engineer Christopher Dunn, he was able to figure out that the per perfect harmonic of the interior of it was A-sharp. And so that's, that is a very special... Um, frequency in many ancient sites for some reason. And now it turns out that this key centers on the musical vortex, which divides the realm of the sharps from the realm of the flats. And last but not least, the musical notation system that we know centers on the key of B flat. Coincidence? So is this thing a torus? It looks a bit different from a regular torus as we know them from science. Well, yes. It's derived from a regular formula for a toroidal path, but it's much simpler. There are only 12 steps and only one path moving at a time. We can also look at all of them moving at the same time, but that is a bit more complicated and doesn't explain the musical tension within one key. When I made this visualization though, the amazing thing was that I took my measurements directly from music and all the numbers inside it were very close to phi ratios. So I made it again and only used the phi ratios they seem to refer to and then I got this. Which is not only beautiful, it also seems to describe the exact dimensions, shape and size of the alien spaceship Bob Lazar described in his amazing story about the experience at Area 52. No, the other area, I forgot the name, S4, C4, something like that. I'm gonna have to make a video about that at some point, but I wanted to be as careful as possible with my first impressions, if you know what I mean. So yes, it's a Taurus, 
but it seems to want to say something interdimensional about the inner vortex, something I don't know yet. In the paintings depicting Jesus though, the shape they use is precisely the same as this one. And if you think about the Jesus fish, what does Vesica Pisces mean? A fish bladder, which is used to move up and down into the water. What does the Vesica Pisces do? It moves up and down in the harmonic cascade, the vortex of music, changing its magnetic equilibrium. Bob Lazar spaceship. So there you have it, in short. I found out what music looks like, what it is and what it does. Now all I have to do is figure out where it does it. This means we're going to have to take a look at the human body. And this is why the next video is going to cover biomagnetism of the human body. So be there or be 